everybody. Good afternoon. I hope you're feeling pretty good since I last talked to you this morning. Day flew by, didn't it? Dead. Um, so we'll get right into the squirrel. So today's topic, um, we're trying to move into it a little, you know, somewhat quickly. We've only got four weeks here. So focus, focus. I know this is a strategy that every single person in this group can relate to. Um, I, I, I'm sure you might have seen that video that I made um, about cleaning my house and, and the multiple number of things that distract me or go through my mind when I'm trying to get it done. And I had so many people ask, you know, uh, do you have ADD? And I was like, no, this is just like a typical day in my head, you know, and I don't have ADD, but I am. What I do have is three children, a husband, a dog, a house to take care of, a business of my own, and, um, you know, a page that I'm running for a very big purpose and a team of coaches that are, serve a very big purpose. And so there's just a lot going on in your mind at any given moment, right? And it's not just me. That's all of us. That's just us. And I think that it is a, I think it's more applies to women more so than men. I think women do have a tendency to um, always have this laundry list of things going on in your head that you need to do or want to do or should do or wish you would have done. And and it can be very overwhelming. And um, she's going to sing. She's singing. She's singing trolls. Okay, so um, so I, I'm really excited to read this chapter with you and to talk about this chapter because I feel like um, it's a really huge way that the enemy can specifically strategize against women is to make you feel really overwhelmed, stretched way too thin, have zero boundaries, say yes to everything, take on too much, and then you end up losing your joy and um, and feeling like giving up and just being like, everyone leave me alone. I can't, I don't care anymore. I don't want to do anything. So, so I think that it's really relatable and I'm, I'm excited to uh, read a bit of this to you. I'm not going to have time to read the entire thing, but I am going to post some afterthought notes later on this evening, probably, um, probably be a little bit later because I also have a team call tonight, but my girls get out at 3.20, so I've got 20 minutes to, to, to give you some good stuff here. So, um, your focus fighting the real enemy. If I were your enemy, I'd disguise myself and manipulate your perspective so that you focus on the wrong culprit. Your husband, your friend, your hurt, your finances, anything or anyone except me. Because when you zero in on the most convenient, obvious places to strike back against your problem, you get the impression that you're fighting for something. Even though all you're really doing is just fighting for nothing. Have you ever felt that way? Like, um, usually when we, when we're feeling that, when we have that kind of, I'm exhausted feeling or like, have you ever just felt like, I don't even know why I'm so stressed out all the time. Like at the end of the day, it's like, you feel like you've been hit by a truck and you just don't even know why. A lot of times it's this, a lot of times it's, you know, you're fighting against all the wrong things and, and all the wrong places and you don't realize it. Fervent prayer relies on focus. You have to focus if you're going to have fervent prayer. Focus clears away dead space and clutter. It's what sharpens the images in your photographs, capturing the detail and highlights you want to remember while pushing less important things to the background or cropping them out altogether. Focus minimizes distractions, lowering your risk of being blindsided. It keeps you from being preoccupied, from looking from overlooking important facts that would have been readily obvious if you'd only been paying better attention. Focus protects your goals and dreams from being consumed in small bites stolen right out from under your nose in 20 minute segments of compromise. And focus is the antenna that prayer helps to keep raised and alert, making you keenly aware of somebody's trying to play you for a fool. And your enemy for his strategy against you to work is dead set on being able to succeed at just that, on fooling you, faking you out, pulling your eye toward a side stage on the theater platform, diverting your focus, trying to convince you that the main issues in your life actually originate over there, anywhere, or with anyone except where they really do. He wants you focused on things that are physical and visible instead of where the action really is. Pay no attention, in other words, to the man behind the curtain. 
Reminds me of one of the more creative displays. Okay, I'm not going to go into that. It's like a random story. But um, here is Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. This is a good one. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, what you can see, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places, what you can't see. That's, that's Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12. Hear that again. Flesh and blood, skin and bones, those aren't the places where your real struggle lies. The identity of your real enemy, once the Bible has weighed in, is clear as day. It's him. It's all him. It's always been him. But in the rough and tumble of life's exhausting pace, we can quickly lose touch with a passage like Ephesians 6. Even in knowing the truth, we can lose sight of where these attacks are originating from, from back there behind the curtain. And by failing to take notice and remember, it's not hard then to lose your cool, your temper, and most of all, our self-control before we, before we ever find our way back to the ultimate reality. Man, that hit Tom, does it not? How many times have you lost your cool, lost your temper, lost control of yourself, um, overwhelmed by your feelings, and she hits the nail on the head, doesn't she? Okay. So I'm going to skip through just a little bit. Let's see. Um, Because there's a couple of good points. The Ephesians of Paul's day didn't need much convincing of the fact that their real problems weren't on the physical side of things. These first century Greeks were mostly pagan, of course, and the spirit world was very much alive in their cognizant awareness. So as God drew men and women to himself... So as God drew men and women to himself from among these pantheistic cultures, these early believers in Christ were already well-schooled in the reality of spiritual entities at at play in the world. Today, however, in Western culture, at least our innate tendency is to underestimate Satan's power. Even his presence is sometimes imagined as make-believe, no more than a phantom wearing a red jumpsuit and a pitchfork, a monster hiding in the closet. We've made him no more than a caricature instead of the treacherous, conniving, hell-bent, personalized menace he truly is. As a result, we sort of give him room to scheme and scare at will, while we run around firing off at anyone and everyone except him. But if all we're doing is whacking at the nearest, most visible symptoms every time they pop their head up, we're doing two things. We're wasting precious time and energy that ought to be reserved and and refocused on the real enemy. And we're trying to fight ferocious spiritual forces by using weapons that don't phase them in the least. Weapons that aren't even designed to hurt them. So the hits just keep coming. Because our focus is all off. And that's exactly what your real enemy is counting on. The real enemy isn't your husband or your teenager or your brother's wife or your mother-in-law or the weather or the traffic or your sweet tooth or whatever powder keg of frustration really gets under your skin and sets you off before you can think straight. The real enemy, the capital E enemy, well, you know who it is. And you simply cannot keep letting him go unchecked while you throw money and anger and logic and psychology at your problems in a vain attempt at overcoming or outsmarting them. In order to live in victory, you must call the enemy's bluff, pull the curtain back, open up your spiritual eyes, and remain continually aware of the one who's truly behind a lot of the stuff you're always blaming on your circumstances, your upbringing, your boyfriend, or whoever, even on yourself. In prayer, you can do it differently. You can maintain this level of focus because prayer, perhaps more than anything, is meant to be an eye-opening experience. Prayer is a reminder to yourself as well as a declaration, declaration to the enemy that you know he's there, that you're on to him. 
When you bring your concerns and fears and irritations to the Lord in prayer, you're aligning your weakling spirit with the full force of God's Holy Spirit. Instead of continuing to fail by taking the battle into your own hands and taking the battle to the wrong people, you're joining instead with all the power of heaven to take your fight directly to the source of the problem. You're following the armies of the living God right into the filled tent where... Your enemy is cooking up his craftiest designs against you, and you're busting up his strategy closet, making sure he knows that you know that you know what he's up to. I'm not saying now that every bad, uncomfortable thing that enters your life is automatically oozing up from the pit of hell. Sometimes simply the nature of the world in which we live can bring tribulation out of the woodwork. And that's found in John chapter 16, verse 33. And sometimes the reap what we sow consequences of our own actions can put us in challenging, arduous uh, positions. And that's in Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. The Bible tells us that God is sovereign enough to employ any device necessary to draw our hearts back to him, whether he's wanting to uncover hidden sins or teach us lessons in trust or refine us and prepare us in whatever way he, deem, he deems fit in his all-wise, all-loving mind. But God, by contrast to the enemy, wants us to know he will use any measure to help us and grow us, even if it calls for the temporary pain of those measures. He wants us to know we can trust him even with difficulty and discipline or with the unavoidable happenings of life on a fallen planet because he promises to work all things together for our good and his purposes. Romans chapter 8 verse 28 is one of my absolute favorite verses. Um, it just, I feel like it is my life. Um, for God will do, uh, God works for the good. God works for the good in all things for those who are called according to his purpose. Mm. I love that verse. I just have to say. Okay, so can I just, um, I'm going to say something real quick about what we just read. Um, you know, she mentioned that sometimes we do have to face that some of the things we're experiencing in life are a direct um, reflection of bad choices we've made and I think that sometimes we like to use the um, the really bad things that maybe have happened to us or um, the uncontrollable things even we like to use them as a reason why it's okay for us to act how we do I did that for a little while and I would I would think to myself well but you know I was um, I was molested and we were super poor and I was bullied and my dad wasn't there and blah blah, blah. I mean I had a laundry list of all the reasons why it was perfectly um, acceptable for me to act out however I wanted if I were to go out and drink and be wild and crazy well that's what happens when you grow up the way I did and when you have things happen to you that I had happen to me and blah 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 the truth is that no matter what happens to you in your life you have a choice how to react to it and how you react to it is 1000% up to you that's your decision sometimes when bad things happen to us we make a decision that makes things worse or has a really horrible ripple effect down the road in our own lives and instead of taking responsibility for that decision that we made we immediately look to blame it on what happened that led us to making that decision but the truth is that decision was in your control and you control what you do and what you say and you have a choice when something bad happens in your life to walk a path of uh, rebellion and and not caring about yourself and not caring about others and and just making one bad decision after another or you can choose to accept what has happened uh, heal deal and go out in the world and make something useful come out of it, right? It is a choice. You don't have to be miserable. You don't have to be, you know, um, depressed and upset. And, and um, you know, you don't have to. You have freedom. You all right? Okay. You have freedom to, to make choices that will help you become a better person. Deciding to wake up every day, deciding to be in this group was a choice that you made to better yourself. You didn't have to make it. You didn't have to make it. You could have just said, no, I don't want to join a group. I don't really want to be a part of that right now. And you could have just continued doing what you're doing. It was a decision. The decision, it could be small things. The decision to read a book like this. 
How many times in your life do you think you walked past a book like this at the Walmarts or any other place, but you looked at it and thought that's for people with real problems and I'm in control of my life and I don't need that. How many times? It's a decision. It's a decision to say, you know what, there might be something valuable in there that I need. There might be something in there that will help me think about things in a different perspective. And it's a decision to say, I'm going to take the time to read. You know, you know how many people to, I don't like to read. I don't have time. It's just, there's too much going on. Well, if you want to, you will make time to do it. If you want to pour into yourself, you will find time to do it. But the enemy swoops in with this per Hey, you know what I noticed? When I'm really finally zeroed in and focused on what God wants me doing, it never fails. It never fails that the enemy will send someone out of nowhere to to ask me if I'll do this. Can I do this? Will I do that? Can I, can I do what anything that will distract me from what he's trying to tell me to do? I've had, you know, um, when the first video went viral, um, I had someone offer me like a, a sponsorship and they, they came out and their initial leading was with money. And, and I, I honestly, I had to be so rooted in what God has me doing that I was able to stay focused and stay on the path, keep my eyes on the back of his head while I follow him into wherever it is he's leading me that I could say to that person, I don't care what you offer me because I know where I'm supposed to be right now and um, I'm going to stick with it. I know what God's using me for. I know where I'm supposed to be and that's where I'm going to stay. And that's the kind of discernment and focus that you want to have. And you have to expect that anytime you're about to do something that God's leading you to do, anytime you're about to do something that God's calling you or pulling you or tugging you towards, there are going to be the enemy knows you so well that he will know exactly the kind of thing to throw at you to get you to start questioning what you're supposed to do. Should I say yes to this person? Should I, you know, say yes to this opportunity? Should I put this on my plate with everything else? Sometimes what you need to do is learn how to say no. Sometimes as women, what we need is boundaries. We need boundaries. You have to get your priorities, you know, straight and, and, and to know where your time and focus needs to be spent and, and to have the nerve to say no to other things. And sometimes that means making someone mad. Sometimes it means not doing something someone wants you to do, but because you know, it's not a part of what you need to be doing right now. And it's not a part of God's purpose or plan for you and that you can't be who he needs you to be. If you're piling a million different things on your plate and saying yes to everybody. You have to know when to say no, and you have to set boundaries, okay? So those are the final two thoughts I'll leave you right this minute. Know when to say no and set boundaries. And um, we'll finish this on focus. I'll post some, uh, some notes and good thoughts later on this evening. All right? I love you, ladies. I hope you're having a really good Thursday, and we'll talk later. Okay, bye.